No mai hari mai. Welcome to Farmers in the Field, where our Earthworker alumni share their regenerative organic horticulture projects. Join us in co-learning through these biology-first conversations and growing radical hope through food. You can hear about our mentors in episode one. Come join us. Kia ora, my name is Coral Ramira, and along with three more women, um, I run Esther's Urban Farm. So the farm got started by a parent from the Waikato Ward of School called Chris McIntosh, and uh, it has been certified organic since 2019, pretty much the same time than when it got started. Um, and we are located in a suburb of um, Kirikiriroa Hamilton called Rotatuna. Uh, so as you can see, we're pretty much surrounded by houses. There's the Waikato Ward of School here. There's a childcare here. So really urban farm. Um, so the land was previously used as pasture for cows, then it got uh, managed biodynamically and some section of it, this section of it here, uh, was used as a community garden for the school. This is what it looked like when it was that community garden. And on the left, I'm just going to play this video. This is what it looked like in 2020. So as you can see, there are two defined areas of the farm. This area over here, we call it uh, the closed field or the original garden. That's where the community garden was. And this section over here, which is the far field. So this image on the right, it's what it looks like right now. So we have a bit more infrastructure. So there's a 48 by 12 meters greenhouse, um, this tunnel, which is this one over here, got completely closed off as well. Um, we have more fruit trees. We have a bit more land open here. And yeah, those are the main changes that have happening around the farm. So every year it keeps evolving and growing, which is fantastic. Um, so the uh, values of Ed Stewart's are create, care and nourish. So we, we believe in creating space for um, people to learn, understand and appreciate nature. Uh, be, we believe in treating our earth and community with care and respect. And we believe that everyone um, should benefit from better nourishment and nutrition. So the production um, at the farm, so Ed Stewart sits in 1.3 acres of land. In 2021, before I attended the Earthworkers course, uh, 3,600 square meters were in production, which mainly were monocrops. So after attending the course, uh, we introduced uh, polycropping into our planting system, which uh, has allowed us to intensify the production by the square meter. So then we've reduced the amount of land that we were using for all crop production and then the remaining has been covered with uh, rotating cover crops so to avoid soil exposure until that land is needed. Uh, the sales outlet uh, for Earth Stewards are a CSA scheme that we have called my Earth Box program which is a, an all year round CSA so it's a weekly a uh, box of veggies, different sizes. Uh, people can come and pick it up from the farm or it, they can get it delivered. Um, we also have orders online through our website. Uh, we recently, well, more or less like six months now, uh, opened a farm shop um, where people can just come and pick up the veggies that they want. And as I said, they can come and collect the the veggie box from from the shop and then uh, during spring summer and autumn we attend the Hamilton farmers market which is on every Sunday from eight o'clock till 12. And um, this is a team so uh, we this farm employs currently three full-time workers um, so that's 
me on the left and Lena, Georgia, and then Bianca on the right, which because I, I failed massively to take a picture of the four of us because uh, Bianca's part time and there's been sickness. And so, yeah, sorry. Um, so, yeah, this is the four of us at the moment. And the goals for Ed Stewards are not only to be a productive farm that follows biology, fresh, regenerative, organic horticulture uh, practices, but also to become a hub for education and research on soil biology. We are excited to be here today with Coral from Earth Steward Farms. She's going to give us um, a, an idea of some of the things she's been using from the Earthworkers course on her farm and also ask us a couple of questions. Daniel Sherman and Levi Brindenson all are here with me to um, facilitate the farmers in the field. So what I learned from the Earthworkers program was the, the importance of the micro and the soil health because being someone that doesn't come from a horticulture background my understanding was very little and just going to the course and you know getting to know a bit better was that relationship between the plants and the microbes and the, the importance of protecting them uh, that's one of the biggest takes uh, from the course uh, and then it follows on to diversity right because the uh, higher the diversity it is uh, within your growing space uh, the, the higher the diversity is going to be of the microbes and one thing that I enjoyed the most as well from the course was learning how to polycrop and it's it's made crop planning easier for us um, our zoning schedule is easier now. Uh, it's helped us a lot with our systems, actually. Um, and this is one of our polycrops. Um, and yeah, another thing that I was mentioning earlier is that before we used to prep the beds with a tilfa that we needed to make uh, the soil slightly, you know, pulverized for us to uh, be able to either direct seed or use a paper pot transplanter. So we've stopped to uh, using all that and instead we're using plugs and it's made our life easier this spring because we didn't have to, it's, it's been really wet and we didn't have to wait uh, for, you know, the soil to be drier because the moment you start using a tilza or, or any sort of like plowing device, you know, if it's wet, it just it turns into like a mad cake and then you can't work with that. So you, you have to hold on. And this year we've been able to almost um, start our planting a month earlier than last year because we didn't have to wait for that. We just had our plugs uh, from our cell trays and we just went straight away. And uh, you can see them now. They are really healthy and we have, you know, something ridiculous like 2,000, uh, just under 2,000 seedlings within 36 square meters because our beds are 120 by 30. Um, and all that diversity is just gonna, you know, work in our favor. So uh, from the left, we have uh, golden beetroot. Then this row here is broccolini and pak choy. Then we have coriander. And then we have again, broccolini and pak choy. This is radish, daikon radish. Then there's broccolini and daikon and red beetroot. And just remind us how many square meters your farm is. The farm has 1.3 acres of land, but um, at the moment we only have 1,800 in production. We used to have 3,600, but because we've increased the production by the square meter, we've been able to free some land, which is going to be one of my questions. We have um, around a thousand square meters that we freed because we don't need it in production and I want to protect the soil in any way obviously I'd rather it been growing plants um, but we, 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 we want to think of different uses of those plants so obviously my initial idea was cover crops 
but then we also train really hard to um, create our own compost. So maybe growing compost, starting materials, um, you know, activities that we could generate out of the 1,000 square meters of land, uh, maybe invite the community um, for some, yeah, all sorts, of ideas, all sorts of ideas. Yeah. Great. So I would like to start um, answering that question. Um, you have um, signaled that you are up for some community activation. You are right beside a school. Um, and you are also part of a kind of a learning hub, aren't you? Right at Learning Hub in Hamilton. So um, there is a, and I'll get Daniel to talk to this a little bit more in a second, but we know of a, a say, a, salary, a, a serious commercial salary um, grower who was in a similar situation. And what they did is they actually grow, grew um, fields of particular flowers. So they had a field of some flowers, another field of, I remember in terms of colors, I can't remember what the blue was, but you know, they basically planted. Phacelia. Yeah, Phacelia. Um, and so they created these kind of fields of color and then they and actually sold, would you believe, um, time slots to come with a photographer to actually have photographic portraits shot in the garden. And they sold out of their time slots. Mm -hmm. They made a significant amount of money doing that. You could take that a step further in that we have um, created a tool called the pasture painting. And if you've got a significant amount of space, there is an opportunity um, to look at potentially creating like a maze or, you know, some actual kind of pathways that people could move through and you could have those designed, for example, by the kids so that there's some sort of buy-in um, around that. And of course, depending on the variety of crops that you grow, you are increasing your pollinator, um, mm -hmm. you know, how many, your biodiversity on your site significantly. You'll be increasing your um, biomass through your photosynthetic photosynthetic capacity but you will um, also um, be creating material for co composting so sunflowers is definitely um, but you want to be doing multiple species ultimately if you can but yeah. what, what are your thoughts on that Daniel? Um, I actually like to <clears throat> before I go into some of those examples um, I'm wondering what Levi is thinking in terms of um, ideas for the space. Yeah <laughs> Um, really cool. Firstly, really cool to hear that um, you've intensified your production and you've figured mm. out that you actually can produce the same amount off less space because that is um, the ultimate goal and that's what we teach. Um, and that the limits to that, are, you know, are constantly being challenged and pushed forwards and that's really cool. Um, so this, this block that you want to do, you want to take it out of production, are you going to be irrigating it? Yeah, we do have irrigation. Okay. There's, there's possibility, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because if that's the possibility, then I guess you're afforded really beautiful kind of creative freedom with whatever species you want to to, to plant in there. Um, obviously, um, you mentioned cover cropping, so diversity in height are going to be the most important. If you're going to want to harvest um, any sort of biomass from that, I would really um, think about at what point you're going to make that intervention. It might be, an, uh, if you're going to cut it in spring to harvest some biomass, then I'd do that in spring enough time for it to regrow back. You wouldn't, ideally, um, coming into potentially a hot, dry summer, you want um I guess photosynthesis and biomass to be tall and green and diverse. Um, those roots yep. and right down into the soil. Um, but but yeah, man, there, there's there's like a an endless amount of things that that you can do there. My my first thought was just to chuck some chuck some food crops in amongst it as well. The stuff that um, grows really well and easy. Um, pumpkins and drew some artichokes were my first thought um it's quite a bit of a mission to i guess start afresh with a thousand square meters so it might be the case of um i guess um do, how are you thinking of transitioning that do you have loads of compost or is it existing species that you've got there 
coral? No, at the moment we have a cobra crop, which is black oats and tick beans, um, just to protect the soil. Uh, it's ridden with dock, so that's why I've been chucking things on it to kind of like shade it. Uh, is that the area that was in potatoes a few yes. years ago? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, yes. yeah. Okay. <laughs> my 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 thinking in terms of um, there's two things about it. One is that you could put it into a crop that really didn't require much other than planting and harvesting. Right? There's no real maintenance. It would take up the summer. Um, it would create a lot of biomass, which would be like corn. Yep. Um, I mean, you can create the old, old the thing that they, they do around different parts of New Zealand, which is the maize maize or the amazing maize maize. You know, the, so you could plant that, harvest it, and potentially also create a maize within that space if you really wanted to sort of do multiple things. Um, yep. The other thing I thought of, I was thinking of, is um, potentially in terms of like. I mean, the idea of planting lots of, um, you know, the sunflowers are the thing that really, really worked well um, in terms of um, the cover crops. They were trying to plant multi-species cover crop, but like the sunflowers would dominate one mix, the phacelia would dominate the other mix. Um, so you kind of look like it were, there were multi-species cover crops, but you were only ever kind of really seeing one species dominate it. Um, but on that space, you're totally right. You don't want to let the the docks go away um, crazy. So yeah, going into something like corn, because that way, what those guys also did, the, the celery growers actually that um, Sarah was talking about, they planted corn and like every month they planted out corn from September, October, November, even December. And then they were harvesting corn like 90 days to 100. To start with the first one took 120 days. And then the next one took 90 days. Um, and they were harvesting corn for quite a long period of time. And they were selling those for like a dollar dollar a cob. And they were selling everything they could produce in that space. Um, so there is potential to generate income that's maybe a bit easier than potatoes. Um, mm. And it's quite a good return. Um, but yeah, you could make a combination of all of these things in terms of having corn as like a primary. You could interplant it. Um, if you wanted to with sunflowers even around the outside or like total totally surround the outside of the corn and sunflowers you could have tracks in the middle of it that you underplant and lower growing flowering clover. species what's that clover so that you yeah can clover i mean clover could be in there as well it will already be there but you can plant corn quite successfully without tilling as well because it's such a large seed you can literally go along and, yeah. and like just poke it in, in the rows um, without really doing massive tilling. Um, that's kind of where I would tend to go because that way you're going to get potentially the best of both worlds. And also when you take the corn off, you're left with a lot of biomass um, that if you chip up, it actually, it actually would be quite a good basis because you harvest corn relatively, the plant's relatively green when you take it off for sweet corn. Um, maize often you see the plants kind of die off and, and it kind of goes brown and more carbon but you could be basically lopping those off and, and chipping them up and putting them into your compost um, all those sorts of things but yeah there's a range of different ideas there I guess okay. you can mix them all up depending on what how your your appetite for um, yeah. you know generating income out of that space but you could be surprised I mean there's 110,000 corn plants usually per hectare so it's like 110 plants per square meter. Mm -hmm. um, no, 11 plants per square meter. 11, sorry. Um, so um, yeah. Anyway, that's and kind the, of, and the yeah. idea, if you are going to do corn, then um, Daniel, I'll get you to tell Coral the days that you um, do the liquid feed on them to raise the bricks levels, so that you actually, you know, you're ensuring that your production is three cobs per plant as opposed to one cob, and then you basically you know, getting three times the production. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the secret to that is um, when the cob, when the, after about, when the young plant's about five leaves high, four to five leaves high, which is usually about five weeks after germination as a, as a rough guess, um, you give them a foliar spray, a, a, a nitrogen um, kick basically to improve the, chlorophyll um, in the plant because the plant is doing a chlorophyll analysis and it's determining how much energy it's got to develop the cob fully. Mm -hmm. 
And if it hasn't got the full energy, you don't, you know how you end up with sweet corn that doesn't have the, the kernels go right around the end of the corn and you get the sort of blind end of the corn. Yeah, that that's a nutrient deficiency. The plant hasn't had the, the capacity to fill it. And this is something that actually determines well ahead of actually producing that cob. It's not something that happens during the production of the cob, but it's actually something that happens um, like a, a, a sort of a couple of months beforehand. And then at, at the 10 leaf stage, so approximately nine to 10 weeks after germination, and they're about knee high, you give them a second application. Um, and what this does is the, the at that point, the corn is kind of doing this analysis again and determining whether it could produce another cob, et cetera, et cetera. So those are some of the things that you can end up with um, uh, with relatively small um, effort, um, end up with a with actually really really good results out of out of a corn crop. Okay. Yeah. The other the other thing, say just if you are growing those corn seedlings as transplants, um, you can under sow them in the in the in the plug with yep. um, clover and oh. marigold, and they work really well under sowing in the same plug um, and then you'll have clover established where you planted the corn and mm. corn does transplant really well it's one yeah. of the things that if you grow little plugs of corn and plant them with the you know again reduces the need to have any sort of um you know the soil tilth isn't really a big um, issue um you know having to sow it it, it, I mean, it's quite funny because we did um, try to grow corn last year on that block. We did a combo of pumpkin and corn, sweet corn, mm -hmm. but we changed varieties and it just did not well at all. Um, so it'd be quite good. I mean, it doesn't have to be right now, but talking more on the WhatsApp group to know what varieties are people growing because... Last year's was really bad. Like we we barely had any harvest. We did you direct up... sow it? Did you direct sow it or did you plant no, it? We, we transplanted it, but um, there was like a mix of yeah, like the dog was everywhere, so it kind of like overtook. It's not only dog. There's all sorts of things in that block. Um, but I guess because this year we have the black oats and the tick beans that could, if we flail mow that biomass. Yeah. And it will cover the ground more you've than it did here. And you've um, also got the nitrogen coming in there from the um, from the legumes as well, yeah. which is a really good start. But I mean, I do leave my suggestion to tra do transplants and under sow those um, with clover would be really good or, or, or anything. And I think you could do, I would do multiple species of corn. I would do yeah. some some more funky different corn as well, not just the, the, the bog standard varieties. Um, yeah. So you can play around with that sort of stuff. So there's there's a yeah. bit more interesting things that can happen in that space. But my, anyway, so my... if you're doing the multi species, you know, different varieties of corn, you are obviously not going to be saving corn um, for seed because they will wind pollinate each other. But I guess it doesn't matter in regards to taste and all the rest of it. So my second question is because our CSA runs all year round. Um, if that and if there are any strategies for winter growing, so mainly for us, we are really struggling with brassicas. Um, you know, things either don't uh, grow that big, or uh, you know, things like cauliflowers they will split open. Uh, so yeah, so last year we. We grew a lot of pumpkins and butternuts, which has been really good for us to keep us going during winter and early spring. But uh, I wonder if there are any other ideas out there. Timing, getting yeah. things, getting things to grow in winter, um, you know, planting it early enough, um, getting it established early enough is, a, is often really the trick with um you know with some of these winter with brassicas and stuff like that they kind of want to be the size that they are behind you there like in um by the end of april um joe when you're planning for winter you're really not planting thinking in terms of, oh that's all planned in june we got thing is what we'll harvest in winter is what you're planting in autumn and you've got to plant early because if you plant those things late and um, I'm Levi, I'm, I guarantee she'll back that up, is it, it just doesn't work. And you yeah. hear it over and over and over again, timing, timing, timing. Yeah. So what, what you're planting in autumn in most cases, you sometimes you've even sown that in summer. So 
leeks is a prime example. You sow your leeks in December, you plant them in March, and you harvest them winter through spring, right? Um, but winter at OMG, at least in, in Auckland, I always found to be the easier, uh, easier than spring, definitely, because the success of winter just basically relies on really crop um, planning and timing, making sure that you are successively planting out beds March, um, April, May. If you can be planting out beds March, April, May, um, and in terms of hero crops for winter that go on into spring, um, the ones that I really love are carrots are just so epic in terms of what you can produce in terms of kilogram volume. Um, and all you got to do is get them germinated in March, April, May, and then they will continue just to sit there right through until spring. Um, celeriac and leek are other really good ones, both winter hardy. Some of those brassicas um, do like, I mean, Levi was talking about planning out for winter in, in say, in May. You, they can do that OMG. I wouldn't suggest that's possible where uh, you're in Hamilton, the Waikato, because I know when you talk to, like, Jenny Lux down at Rotorua, there's no way they're still planning stuff out at that time of the year, right? It, it's too late. Um, so you've got different seasonalities that you've got to work with. Um, and, and maybe the variety, uh, you've got to talk about maybe some of the varieties of those things like the cauliflower, because I've had really good success with those for argument's sake down here in Marlborough, and it gets a hell of a lot colder here um, than you are. And um, so whether whether that's a, a, an, an issue, maybe that's the discussion that you have to have on the WhatsApp channel in terms of uh, having a conversation about what varieties people are getting and where people are getting that success with them. Um, you know, it, it, that's just a, ma a matter of understanding when to plant those those things out. But um, yeah, a lot of it is just that you've got to think in terms of what, not what you're planting in winter, but what you're harvesting in winter and when, how early you have to plant it. That's really the secret to getting it right. And then it is actually quite an easy season mm -hmm. in many cases to deal with. Um, that gap transition between winter and spring um, is, is much trickier um, because you can end up with a hole right there. Um, because you can't get stuff in the ground quick enough. But like you've discovered, you can gain a month by simply not cultivating and leaving out the tilling. And every every vegetable grower in the country that still tills, the biggest conversation they have in spring is, well, we can't get the crop planted, we can't get the crop planted. And sometimes that actually extends all the way through to Christmas, like corn and maize that they couldn't get in the ground for two or three months because it's too wet because they've got to till it all. Where if they were direct drilling, it'd all be in there regardless. So just goes to show you that's a very, very clear common advantage you get out of no-till. But also to come back to your question about, um, you know, you've got your thousand square metres that you're looking at. You're absolutely right. Your pumpkins, um, you know, Rumbacante is an amazing storer and grows all the way through. You can actually harvest it as a, like a zucchini right up and, you know, right into autumn. It doesn't get powdery mildew, but also, you know, Kumara. So you're really looking at, um, you know, what are the things that store well? Um, so maybe you want to be thinking about, um, you know, the thousand square meters that you've got, you know, what are the things that you can get in there that, um, you know, will produce you things that store really well as well? Yeah, just on that one last thing is um, find a cool variety of corn that you can keep the seed of and turn it into a uh, a, a cornmeal or a grain because there's so many gluten-free people out there and it could be an amazing thing to do a collab with on a bakery or whatever yes. so, so sweet corn is if you don't want to be putting time into that field don't grow sweet corn because then you've got to harvest it within the window that it's sweet and then it mm -hmm. turns crap coral you're doing an amazing Fabulous job, job coral. and you know the, you're doing it you, you really are amazing so i just want you to get from you know, our team, just how yeah. appreciative we are that you take this so seriously and that you're out there actually implementing it. So, you know, hats off to you. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Um, again, uh, I really appreciate your work towards, you know, putting these, these course together and all the support that you're giving us all. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Bye. If you are inspired to become an earth worker and learn more about regenerative organic horticulture, look up our earth workers program on our website to register for our upcoming courses. 
If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support us in making more, we welcome donations on our website, fortheloveofbees.co.nz. For the Love of Bees is a charitable trust creating a system of self-sustaining urban farms in Aotearoa that cultivate quality food for local people through regenerative organic horticultural practices that heal the ecosystem. Through these sites, we create happier and healthier ecosystems and resilient, connected communities. We also create and share high-quality, accessible educational experiences around what a truly regenerative world looks like. For the Love of Bees aims to become a world-leading example of partnership, regeneration and participation for a thriving collective future. We started in 2016 as an optimistic and love-centred approach to engaging with ecosystem well-being in a time of climate uncertainty.